guidelines that you may have seen in the newspaper um, and maybe from your doctor or your local county about the pause that's currently going on in terms of administer administering the Johnson & Johnson vaccine against COVID-19. Now, this one I've been paying particular attention to, not just because I'm interested in the science, but I'm one of the people who have already gotten the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, so this is something that matters to me personally, um, but I'm sure many of you may have some, some of the same questions that I've been asking as well. So I wanted to join you to give you an overview of where things stand right now in terms of what we know about the science, um, what those of you in my boat are th might be thinking about and what questions to ask, and what it looks like for the future in terms of getting the Johnson & Johnson vaccine back into our toolbox for fighting the pandemic. So let's start by just quickly reviewing kind of what the situation is and what caused the um, the vaccine to go on pause. She says you're on from the neck down. Okay. And they can't see your face. All right. Let me. It looks. Like, it sounds like my camera is off a little bit, so I'm going to step back a little bit. Like I, like <laughs> I can see your face. We're having some technical difficulties. <laughs> Let's. Bear with me for a she second. She was wrong, apparently. Okay. So I think we're okay. Let us know in the comments if you can see me or if you can only see me from the neck down. <laughs> Hopefully what I'm just saying is, is more interesting and more fun to watch if you can see my face. <laughs> live, live programming, here we are. <laughs> okay, so let's review wh what the situation is that caused the FDA and the CDC to put this pause on, on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So what we know is that so far to date, almost 7 million people have gotten that the single dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Of those, six cases of blood clots were found in people who had gotten the vaccine about one to two weeks after they had gotten their shot. So this is kind of interesting because one reason that I want to say up front is that the concern around these blood clots is completely unrelated to the effectiveness of the vaccine against COVID. So if you have gotten the vaccine, you know, be assured that you are still developing your immune system's antibodies against the COVID coronavirus. So that's not what's at question. But in addition to the vaccine being effective, we also want to make sure that the vaccine is safe. And so when this kind of cluster of side effects shows up, the FDA and the CDC want to investigate to make sure that there isn't something bigger going on that might affect many more people than we might be aware of right now. So that's why they have paused it for a couple of days so far um, to figure out and investigate what's going on. Now, why were scientists particularly concerned? Because, you know, blood clots happen, you know, not infrequently. There are a couple of reasons why this particular blood clot raised alarms. And before I go much further, you've got a question, so I'm going to pause and let's take that. Um, is the um, Johnson Johnson vaccine still being manufactured, or is that also on pause? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer for sure. Um, the pause was specifically just recommended. Many um, counties and federal vaccine sites have paused on administering it. I don't know whether that actually applies to manufacturing, but that's a great question. We got another question. So I'm told that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine isn't as effective against COVID as the other vaccines. Is that true? That is another great question that there's been a lot of discussion about, and it's actually hard to compare the numbers because they're sort of apples and oranges, the way that the different companies uh, actually you know, look for the statistics um, and, and set up their analyses. But one important you know, top level thing to communicate in terms of the numbers that you might have been hearing are that the two mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna were both in testing last summer before the virus had a chance to change. So if you've heard about the different variants of the virus that are spreading right now, 
not all of the vaccines are a little bit less effective against these variants than they were against the version of the virus that was circulating last summer. So both of those mRNA uh, vaccines um, have really amazing effectiveness, but even that effectiveness is, is less when it comes to some of the variants. And that variant was already happening when the Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, was being tested. So it's a little bit hard to compare directly, but what we do know is that all of them are very effective in protecting against um, severe symptoms and disease. So no matter what you get, <laughs> they're all gonna protect you from getting really sick and ending up in the hospital and dying. So you know, bottom line, they all work. Okay, so we definitely you know, keep, keep asking questions about how this compares to some of the other vaccines because that, that's something important to think about um, as we move forward. Um, but let's come back to these particular blood clots that, um, that scientists saw in these six people. The couple of factors that caused alarm, one was that they were all within women within the ages of 18 to 48. So that's a relatively you know, narrow demographic, you know, myself included here. <laughs> Um, but if, you know, if it was random, you would expect, you know, an even distribution between men and women. Now, all of that could still be true because there's only six cases. But the other thing that raised alarm bells was that a similar side effect of these blood clots was observed in people in Europe who had gotten an AstraZeneca vaccine. And that AstraZeneca vaccine has not yet actually, um, been authorized for use in the U.S., but it's based on a similar vaccine technology as the, um, as the Johnson & Johnson. They both use a harmless delivery virus to give you the instructions for creating a piece of the COVID virus that, you're, that then prepares your immune system. So there's a potential that there's some effect of this delivery virus that is causing, um, you know, causing the body to produce these blood clots in a very, very small number of people. But that, you know, that sort of same observation in these two different vaccines was another thing that just made scientists want to stop and, and, and look a little bit deeper. So the third thing that was really unusual among these six patients um, that was again also observed in some of these European patients, was that in addition to having these blood clots, those clots happened in, in unusual places. So these are blood clots that were found either in the brain or in the abdomen, um, sometimes both. That's a really weird place for blood clots to happen. That's not where most blood clots are found. Usually those happen in the legs or the lungs, so not only are these blood clots in rare positions in the body, but these patients also had very low levels of platelets in their blood. And so platelets are normally contribute to, um, to blood clots. They help your blood clot at sites of injury. Uh, and so the fact that you have this combination of rare blood clots with low platelet factors is really strange. And that's what scientists want to investigate. Now, we don't know yet why this is happening. There's still a possibility that it could just be chance, but we need to know. And so why this pause? I think for, for three reasons. One is to review the data to really assess the risk. You know, we've been hearing that, you know, when we think about the nearly 7 million people who have gotten the vaccine, um, with just six patients who have been observed to have these blood clots, well, that's, that's such a small risk. Do we really need to worry about it? Well, let's, let's figure that out. <laughs> um, so the FDC, FDA and the CDC are pulling together their uh, vaccine advisory committee um, to review the data, to see whether there might be more cases hiding in the numbers that we you know, didn't pick up on before, as well as to look at, you know, knowing that it takes one to two weeks for this to develop, what should we expect to see in the next couple of weeks as, you know, people like me who have just gotten their vaccine in the last couple of days 
get into that critical period, um, how many cases might we expect to see if it is in fact due to the vaccine? So that's one question that they'll be looking at, is to figure out you know, what really is the risk. The second is to investigate more about those risk factors. So are there some common underlying health concerns um, in those six people that may have led to them um, you know, developing these blood clots that we should be aware of? Because ultimately what that's going to do is help give guidance to doctors about how to give advice to their patients how to diagnose this when it happens, and how to treat it. And, and that's all really important because no medical treatment is without risk. It's all about how to manage that risk. So as an example, we already knew that for the mRNA vaccines for Pfizer and Moderna, that use a different type of technology, they have a different type of risk, that there's a risk of a severe allergic reaction or anaphylactic shock. So for those of you who have gotten your vaccine already, you know you have to wait 15 minutes or maybe 30 minutes if you have a history of allergies. Those guidelines are in place to manage that risk of anaphylactic shock. So once we understand better um, why this, these blood clots are happening, whether they're associated with the vaccine, we can take appropriate steps to then manage that risk and, and watch out for it. All right, let's pause for another question. Do all vaccines made with this technology have the risk of blood clots, or is it just um, this vaccine in particular? That's a really great question, and we don't know that for sure. So, we, um, so during the clinical trials, there were a few instances of blood clots that were found, and so this was something that the safety boards were on the alert for. That being said, there's, we still don't know the mechanism about why this particular vaccine technology would cause blood clots. So it's not an association that we've really seen before to be able to understand it. All right, and then the other thing to figure out during this pause is then how to move forward. Um, because we have other vaccine options, we are in a fortunate position of being able to make some, some smart choices about this. So for instance, in Europe, um, they're now recommending that AstraZeneca vaccine only for older people because there's a different um, risk benefit ratio for older people than there are for younger people. So that's something to take into uh, consideration as to whether we have a better idea of how to target these vaccines uh, for the people who can benefit the most with the least risk. So these are the questions that the advisory committee will be thinking about um, and, and what the FDA and the CDC will consider as they decide uh, how to move forward with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, in the coming weeks and days. So if you're like me and you've already gotten the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, what should you be thinking about? First of all, you know, let's not panic. <laughs> you know, no matter which way you slice it, um, you know, six people among millions who have gotten the vaccine is a, is a very low risk. So we should all be, you know, cautious and thinking about our symptoms, but it's very unlikely um, that me or anybody else or any one of us um, will develop those blood clots. Um, you know, we just have to watch out for those who get, you know, who, who get unlucky. That said, there are symptoms of these blood clots that, you know, we should be aware of. Um, and some of those symptoms are things like severe headaches, um, uh, changes to your vision because of that blood clot in the brain, uh, severe nausea or vomiting, or in very rare cases, seizures. So if you've gotten the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you know, once you're over that first wave of uh, side effects from the immediate uh, immunization, you know, just, just be aware of how you're feeling. And in fact, um, you can actually help scientists collect this data. So the CDC has a program called vSafe um, that is a vaccine monitoring program that, you know, sends you a text message to check in with you every day to see how you're feeling. Um, so that's a way that you can actually help scientists monitor the effects of these vaccines. All right, let's pause for another question.
question. Can blood can can blood clots be cured? So blood clots can be treated, um, and I'm glad you asked that question because one of the things that doctors discovered in working with these patients is that one of the standard treatments for blood clots doesn't actually work in this case and actually, and actually can make the situation even more severe. Um, and that's really one of the red flags that the CDC and the FDA wanted to get out there to doctors across the country. So one of the common treatments for blood clots is a blood thinner called heparin. Um, and in this case, it turns out, you know, because of the association with the low platelets, that heparin actually makes the blood clot worse. So there are other treatments, but unless we knew that to look out for this, um, and you know, we wouldn't necessarily know, you know to avoid heparin in that, in that standard treatment factor. So again, this all goes into just figuring out how to manage the risk. Okay, so then finally, what does this mean as we think about our broader efforts to vaccinate the population both nationally and globally? Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to know right now. We'll have to wait and see, you know, what the advisory committee um, reports back um, and then what decisions the FDA and the CDC make based on that guidance. You know, in the short term, I think, you know, people may have more confidence in some of the other vaccines and, and that's okay. Um, you know, one of the things that we know is that, you know, with any new uh, technology or medical treatment that comes out, it takes time to build up confidence. And most of the vaccines that have been administered in the U.S. so far have been Pfizer or Moderna, and we're seeing really great results with both of those. Um, and so if that's what's available to you, great. <laughs> go get one. Go get, go get a vaccine. <laughs> That said, the Johnson & Johnson had some unique advantages that made it really important for our wider vaccination strategy. Um, because it doesn't have some of the technological challenges of you know, having to be stored and transported at super cold temperatures. Um, it was only one dose, which was certainly you know, one of the reasons that it made it attractive for me. <laughs> Um, you know, just being one and done was great, um, and so it, it's really helpful to have that in your toolbox uh, in terms of getting the vaccine out to as many people as possible as we try and fight this pandemic. Uh, and so I think that, you know, based on the guidance of the, you know, that, that comes out in the you know, next couple of days, we'll have a better idea of how and you know, under, with what strategy we'll, we'll start thinking about getting the Johnson & Johnson vaccine out there again. Um, but certainly you know, at, the, at the small level of risk that we're seeing right now, um, I don't anticipate that it's going to get, you know, get taken out of rotation altogether. Okay, let's pause for another question. Do you mind being like a guinea pig? You know, I, I was really excited <laughs> when I got my vaccine. You know, COVID has caused such devastation and loss um, to so many people that, you know, the, any vaccine that, you know, we've seen the success of all, th all three of these vaccines in preventing that, you know, that severe symptoms and, and, and hospitalization and death that, to me, yes, of course there's a risk and this is something that we, each of us thinks about, um, but I, I appreciate the process um, by which these vaccines get tested. Um, you know, certainly very, very rare side effects like this don't get picked up in clinical trials. Even clinical trials that involve tens of thousands of people can't pick up on side effects that happen in, on like a one in a million scale. So for me, I think it's always a balance thinking about the risk, right? Like, when you have COVID, you have a risk of getting blood clots. When you, you know, even just you know, taking ibuprofen um, can raise your risk of stroke. Um, I, you know, I've seen a lot of statistics being thrown out there that you know, may or may not be helpful in you know, assessing, assessing risk. But you know, the National Safety Council, for instance, you know, knows, you know, has said that your risk of dying in a car accident is one out of 107. So when you start to think about all of the different risks that we face in life and thinking about the risks 
to ourselves and to our families and our communities that are that we face with COVID. For me, you know, I I like to think that I'm you know help, out there helping keep everybody safe. Um, so that that's a risk that that's acceptable to me. And I think that's a decision that lots of people are making because you know we want to we want to live life again. Um, in a way that, that, that just isn't possible right now until we can get this virus under control. Um, so the last point that I want to make is that, you know, there's been a lot of questions about should, should the FDA and the CDC have paused? And ultimately, I think what that shows us in the long term is that our systems work, our systems of monitoring safety. And that's one of the things that you know, I think my, my goals through these conversations about COVID, about the process of developing new medicines, about the process of developing tr uh, vaccines has been, is to help everybody understand the, the process as clearly and as transparently as possible. Because science only works, you know, if, if we all, you know, appreciate and, and think about how it's done in a way that is, um, that is as rigorous and as inclusive um, as possible to help the most people. And so when I think about the fact that, you know, there's only, you know, we're looking at six people here, but what happened to those six people matter? And the fact that our system picked up that six people out of seven million um, had this particular effect means that our systems are working and we have the tools to then look at those potential concerns and address them. And I think in the long run, that's, that's a good thing because we don't want these to get ignored um, because that ultimately just means that, you know, there's less concern for safety for all of us. So, you know, in the short term, yes, maybe this, you know, sets us back a little bit. But I think we're in a really good position where we have alternative vaccines um, that we can get out to lots and lots of people. Um, we have the kind of systems that can catch and investigate these potential concerns and hopefully we'll come up with a strategy um, for managing the risks and, and continuing to get this you know, very effective vaccine out to lots of people. So in the meantime, I'm going to keep sending in you know, my health data every day um, as a check-in for myself um, to, to think about my symptoms. Um, but I'm also really excited from two weeks to the, you know, to the day I got my vaccine when uh, I can have a, you know, take a deep breath that I'm a little bit more protected against the pandemic. Thanks so much for joining in. Do we have any other questions before we sign off? Nope. All right. Well, I hope that helped answer some of your questions and, uh, and help you make sense of what you're hearing in the news. Um, we'll be back again uh, if there's, uh, as soon as there's more to talk about. In the meantime, of course, stay safe. If you can get, get a vaccine, please do. If you have questions, please reach out to those of us at the Franklin Institute. We're happy to talk um, about your questions and concerns anytime. Thanks so much.